Yeah, tonight we celebrate the fact that he came as an infant, came ultimately to redeem us, but he's coming again. So we get to celebrate that as well tonight. Our scripture readings from Isaiah 6, I'm sorry, Isaiah 9, starting with verse 6. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. Sing this together, joy. Joy to the world, the Lord is Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare Him move, and heaven and nature sing, and heaven and nature sing, and heaven. Christmas. Welcome to Black Forest Chapel. Um, a lot of familiar faces, a lot of new faces, so we're really glad you're here on behalf of the Black Forest Chapel family, all of our members and leadership. We're just thankful that we can worship our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ with all of you tonight. So uh, it's been a very difficult year for many, and we made it, right? We made it to the end, so that's good. Um, but what we celebrate tonight is the only true hope that we have, the only hope we've had throughout the entire year, and that's Christ. Christ alone. So uh, if you would pray with me and we'll continue on in the spirit of worship. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful to be here and we're so thankful for your presence always with us. And Lord, tonight we celebrate your son who you sent as a ransom for many. You sent to die on a cross for the forgiveness of sins. Our greatest need Lord, was that we were spiritually dead, and we could not make our way to heaven. We couldn't earn it. We couldn't do anything, Lord. And so you sent your son in the form of a baby, Emmanuel, God with us, an incredible miracle, something that we can't fully understand. Lord, we're, we're thankful for that. And thank you that as he grew, he wanted to glorify you, and he went to the, to the cross. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for going to the cross for us for taking away our sins. And if we would put our faith in you, if we would believe in you, we would have everlasting life. And so Lord, we celebrate that tonight, that you are the true light of this world. Nothing else compares to you. Help us now, Lord, as we continue to worship, give us energy, give us strength. Help us to really enjoy your presence. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Yeah. 
Lucas and Heather to come up for our Advent candle lighting, and as they come, um, just reminding you guys for those who are wanting to uh, bring a tither offering this evening, we have a couple ways of giving. There are offering boxes in the back by the uh, exit doors, or you can give online at blackforestchapel.org. Well, good evening, everyone. My name is Lucas Hansen, and I'm so happy to be here tonight with you all. This is my wife, Heather. We just got married in July, and uh, we came out here. <laughs> we, we came out here, and uh, we very quickly found a home with Black Forest Chapel. We feel so welcome here. Yeah, y'all can sit down. <laughs> we have felt not only welcome here, but this has been a rare find where people want to bring you into a place where you can serve, where you can be a part of the family and not just someone on the outside looking in. And so I want to extend a great thank you to everyone who's a part of this church for showing us what family looks like in a church building. And tonight as we celebrate uh, Advent, we just like to light all five of the candles. And I, I'm going to give it to my wife because she's got the first one. So we've been doing Advent at this church for the past four Sundays, and we light one candle each week. So four Sundays ago, we lit a prophecy candle, and this is a sign of hope. We remember those who first spoke promises of the coming Christ child. All right, and then three Sundays ago, we lit a candle called the Bethlehem candle, and uh, that was a symbol of peace, and it was also something that was to remind us to prepare, um, specifically to prepare to receive this, this gift, this precious child, and, and the preparation in that, we talked about the cradle and how the cradle was ready to receive Christ, and we were also wanting our hearts to be ready so that we could receive this precious gift being given to us. Okay, and then two Sundays ago, we lit the shepherd's candle. This one is an expression of joy. Uh, we remember that the shepherds were the first of many who um, would tell joyfully the good news um, about the Savior. And then, if you were here last Sunday, we lit the angel candle, which was supposed to be a reflection of love, or a symbol of love. And uh, that reminds us that we are redeemed, that when we bring Christ in faith into our lives, that he redeems, he restores, he heals. And it's all a matter of that great love. So. 
And uh, oh, I get the privilege, if you were here also for that week, um, Pastor Mike talked about expressions, um, what it looks like to praise. And I thought, we have finally arrived tonight. And so while I was thinking about this, I thought, Lucas, you need to have an expression of praise because Advent is over, people. We have arrived at the Savior's birth. And so I said, I was going to do a little jump. Yes! <laughs> Y'all don't have to do that with me, but however you want to praise, we have made it. It's worth celebrating. Yay. <laughs> so Lucas and I have been doing... Um, Advent this year from a book called Celtic Daily Prayer. And so as we light this last candle, this one's for Jesus. Um, so I'm just going to say a prayer from this book. Um, this candle is for Jesus, cradled in Mary's womb from Nazareth to Bethlehem on Caesar's command turned away from the inn that had no room, to be born in a manger where animals fed, greeted by shepherds from nearby fields and magi from distant lands. Today, now that Christmas has come, we light five candles. We've marked Advent with candle flames. Today we celebrate Jesus' birth by lighting all the Advent candles and the Christmas candle at the center. When our path is menaced by shadows, circle us, Lord. Keep your light within. Keep darkness without. When our path is targeted by conflict, circle us, Lord. Keep your love near and keep hatred afar. When our path is threatened by worry, circle us, Lord. Keep your peace within and keep fear without. Okay, thanks. Let's stand for our final song this evening. He who was before there was light Walked across the pages of time He who made every living thing Behold him He who heard humanity's cry Left his throne to wake as a child Came like the least of us. Behold him, Jesus, Son of God, Messiah, the Lamb, the roaring lion. Oh, be still and behold him.
You may be seated. Thank you, worship team. Appreciate you guys very much. Thank you, Heather and Lucas. Uh, I love that. I, I love this. It's, it's a true celebration um, when the those lighting the candles are, are, are jumping for joy, celebrating the birth of our Savior. I love it. But next time, I'd, I don't know if our liability insurance covers it, but I'd like you to jump and light at the same time and see, <laughs> see what happens. Actually, no, don't do that. <laughs> it's just so great to be able to be here with everyone and to celebrate with you all tonight. So thank you for being here. Um, just, you know, I think we can celebrate on our own um, occasionally in our cars and at our homes and obviously with our families. We'll celebrate tonight, maybe tomorrow morning and, and throughout the week. But there's something about coming together as God's people. There's something about gathering corporately and lifting our voices. We talked about that last week, praising the Lord together. That's just powerful. It's, it's a testimony to the world. It, it encourages our own hearts. So, so thank you for coming and participating with us tonight. So. Uh, we're going to be in the, the book of John, the Gospel of John. Um, and so I'd like to pray for us, and then we'll read some of God's word and, and hear what the Lord has to say to us. So let's pray together. Father, we thank you uh, for this gathering of your people. Thank you that we can praise your name, to lift your name high. This is not about us, Lord. It's about you. The entire Bible is about you. And it all points to Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, who came and accomplished something that we could not. He died on the cross as a perfect lamb, and by his blood we are saved if we would believe by faith. And when we do that, we have so many promises, so many amazing things that take place in our life where we belong to you, we are sons and daughters, we are adopted into your family. The church becomes your family. You are the head, Lord Jesus, and we submit to you and we love you. And we are heirs with Christ for eternity. The inheritance of the kingdom is ours. We have a, an amazing hope to look forward to the eternity with you, God, in perfection and glory. We can't even understand it. That's how amazing it is. So thank you, Lord, for all that you've done. And it began long ago, Lord, and it culminated with your son coming to earth in the form of a baby, fully God, fully man, and a mystery that's a, it's just incredible that causes us to rejoice. And thank you, Lord, that you are the true light. You are the light of the world and the darkness shall not overcome it. And Lord, we just ask now you would help us to understand your word as uh, we look at the Gospel of John, your servant who wrote about these great things. Uh, as we look at the Gospel of Luke and some other places, Lord, would you please help us understand Holy Spirit, open our minds to truth, and ultimately help us to obey what we hear. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. I'm going to read out of uh, John chapter 1, and then we're going to look a little bit in Luke as well. John chapter 1, verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This is Jesus Christ. He's always existed. He's eternal God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness, this is John the Baptist, to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth." And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's the incarnation. That's the glorious incarnation, Christ coming to earth. 
And we'll take a, take a look at um, Luke chapter 1. We'll look at the uh, part of Zechariah's prophecy. This is more of the traditional Christmas story that we're familiar with. John's story is just as relevant, <laughs> Christ coming to earth. Luke chapter 1, Zechariah, who is John the Baptist's father, he's a priest. He, he's prophesying about the coming Christ. He said, and, and his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesying, prophesied, saying in verse 68, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, child, meaning John the Baptist, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his way, to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins. Because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high, to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. It's a beautiful picture, the tender mercy of God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death. The shadow of death is, is a deep darkness, a deep gloom, a hopelessness, really, and to guide our feet in the way of peace. Light, um, I think, universally stands for things that we understand. We just, we just lit some candles related to hope and peace and joy and love. Right? Light has that, that symbolism for us. And so we've got candles and we've got Christmas trees lit. And um, as we know, Christmas time is the season of light. Right? It's, 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 it's dubbed that. Um, whether you're in the church or not in the church, it's, we just understand it. And part of it... Um, I think is just there's a tradition element to it. We, we enjoy doing those things. My, our neighborhood is just, it's, it's lit up, right? You can't escape the lights on everyone's houses, so everyone's got the, they've, they've got their insurance policy out, and they've got their ladders out, and they've got all the lights hanging all over the place, and the house is lit up like crazy. You can hear the meters running at night, just humming, right? The whole thing, the, the whole street is lit up. It's beautiful. And uh, you shut your lights off at night to go to bed, and nothing changes because it's just coming in. Um, but, it, but it's fun to look at, and everyone lights up everything this time of year, right? Their homes, their trees, trees everywhere, your cars. People actually have lights in their cars and wreaths on their cars, and, and sweaters are lit up. And who has, who has a sweater that lights up here tonight? Because you're going to become an illustration if you... So no one? Okay, good. But sweaters, hats, right? The dog's lit up. Everything's lit up. We, we like to light things up. Why? Because light represents something to us. It's, 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 it represents hope. Right? And peace. Ultimately, in the Bible, light represents salvation as well. If you think about light, if you're stranded somewhere in the complete darkness, what is your only hope? If you can see your way out, if you can see a light. If you're stranded at sea and your ship is just dead in the water and you have, you have no hope of, 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 of navigating it at that point and you see a light in the distance, there's hope all of a sudden. Right? Maybe it's a ship, maybe it's land. And so we're looking for hope, especially in a year like this when everything just seemed dark, right? Not just that the season's shorter and it's light for like two hours during the day, right? But it's, it's more like the, the political realm and, and with COVID and, and all the things going on and just the distance and isolation and discouragement and depression and financial struggles and relational struggles. We, we need hope. We need something to hold on to. And, and that's who Jesus is. He is the true light versus all the other false lights that are out there. Right? We try to hold on to, we try to light up things um, without him and it doesn't last, right? It's not the same. And so that's what we're going to talk about a little bit is just the true light, the light of the world, Jesus Christ, who brings hope and peace and salvation to us. Because none of us really like the dark, if we're honest, at least not for very long. The, the lights go out, the power goes out, and we had a transformer that was hit in our, 
area a few weeks ago, and the lights went out. So it's kind of fun. You're finding your camping lights, and you're getting candles. And, but after about an hour or two of that, and you have to actually brush your teeth and find things in the house, and you're in the fridge reaching for the back, and you're like, I don't know what this is, and I don't know if I should eat it, right? At that point, it becomes not very much fun anymore. You, you, you start to hit your shin on, on a piece of furniture, or you slip down the stairs. And so so we, we don't really like the darkness. It's good for sleeping, right? It's good for flashlight tag, and maybe if you're a professional ninja or a vigilante street fighter, that's pretty much the only things I could actually try to list out <laughs> what is darkness good for. That's pretty much it. If you might have a longer list than me, but other than that, it doesn't help much. If anything, darkness just hinders us, right? Without light, we stumble, and without light, the Bible says we, we are without knowledge, We can't see, we can't perceive the world around us. Not just we can't see in the fridge, can't see expiration dates, but we can't see who's in the room. We can't see their facial expressions. We can't see what's going on. We can't navigate things around us. Without light, we can't drive and we can't do anything that we would normally do in the evenings, right? Without light, we're kind of stuck. We can't read, we can't learn, we can't walk around freely. Darkness impacts everything, true darkness, physical darkness, in the truest sense, impacts everything. And we're never really in, in complete darkness, right? There's always moonlight or there's always ambient light from lights around us. But when we're in real darkness, it's, it's a bit suffocating. We don't like it for very long. It impacts our minds, it impacts our bodies, our relationships, our entire life. Ultimately, the problem is we can't find our way. In physical darkness, we're lost. And in the same way, the Bible talks about spiritual darkness. In spiritual darkness, we are lost, we are morally depraved, we are spiritually dead. We cannot find our way. A number of passages talk about spiritual darkness. What, is it, what does it kind of relate to? How is it described? Psalm 82.5 says the people that are spiritually darkened, who do not have Jesus Christ, do not have the Lord, they have neither knowledge nor understanding. They walk about in darkness. So we don't have knowledge, we don't have understanding, we live in ignorance, we live in folly, we do things that are not wise, right? It's wise in our own eyes, but it's not really truly wise. It doesn't help anyone. And we see this with um, a general lack of maybe common sense, but there seems to be a stumbling around when it comes to um, those who are in places of authority, maybe those even in our own families, those in, in our workplaces, in our schools. They, 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 they are trying, almost stumbling, almost groping, looking for hope, looking, for, looking to do something right and something well. But without the wisdom of God, they just create more problems for themselves and for everyone around us. Sinful man in trying to solve Sin's problem just creates more problems. And so it's a, it's a picture of someone just in a dark room stumbling around looking for a way out, looking for light, tripping over things, kicking things down, running into people, making a mess, hurting themselves, hurting others. That's what darkness does to us. Proverbs 4, 18 and 19 says, but the path of the righteous is like the light of dawn which shines brighter and brighter until full day. Those who are righteous, those who believe in God, whose minds have been opened to truth, who have received that truth, their path is, is like the light of dawn, which shines brighter and brighter until the full day. It's, it's a beautiful picture of being able to see and perceive and move and live, right? But the way of the wicked is like deep darkness. They do not know over what they stumble. This is God's truth about darkness versus light. Other places in the New Testament talk about our minds being darkened. We have a darkened understanding. Our hearts are darkened because of our lack of knowledge of the Lord. So darkness is described as ignorance and folly and fear and evil and bondage and misery and wrath. That's what it's equated to in Scripture. That's what God says about darkness. And for those of us who do not know Jesus Christ, who have not put our faith in him, we are, you are still living in darkness. If you don't know him, you're living in darkness. You're spiritually dead. There's nothing that you can do. You need light to come in and dispel the darkness for you, right? 
if you think about it, it's interesting. We turn on the light to dispel the darkness. You don't turn on darkness to cover the light, right? It, it, it works differently. And so the only remedy for darkness is light. That's the only remedy. You can't be in the dark and just, you can't just yell at it, right? You can't fi- like work your way out and figure it out. You can't hope it goes away. The only thing that you can do for darkness is wait for light to show up. Right? Whether you have a flashlight, whether you create light through a candle, whether the sun rises, that's the only way that darkness is dispelled, physically. And the same thing spiritually. The only way that you can come out of spiritual darkness is by receiving the light of life, the true light in Jesus Christ. And so the nature of power and of the nature of the power of spiritual light, as, as we already talked about, the nature of it is that it's hope. It provides hope and peace and love and salvation. It's one of the consistent images in Scripture. Psalm 27 one says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? And Jesus in John 8.12, uh, so same chapter, John loves to describe or to relate Jesus. He gives the imagery of light often throughout his, uh, throughout his gospel. But in John 8, uh, chapter 12, Jesus, this is one of his I am statements. Again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And, and this was a time where uh, the, the Feast of Booze or the Feast of Tabernacles had just, had just completed. And so Jesus was in the temple, in the temple courts, and he often used things that were in the room to help teach, Right? So earlier he talked about being, the, he provided spiritual water, come to him and drink and you will have life. And, and, he, and he was really attacked for that because there was some ceremonies and rituals taking place about pouring water at the end of the feast. And so Jesus was equating himself to these things. He was teaching people that your rituals and all your traditions and all the, all the things you're doing are pointing to him, right? But people are, are oftentimes they get um, focused in on these false lights, on the rituals themselves. And so when he, Jesus says, I am the light of the world, it's, it's um, well understood that in the temple there were, there, were, there were these giant candelabras and there were these giant bowls full of oil and during the feast they would burn brightly and they would fill up the temple court and fill up the entire temple. And so these lights were signifying um, light coming into the darkness, the, the, the prophecy of the Messiah. And Jesus is saying, that's me. I am the light of the world. And, and at that point, these candles would have been out and these, this light would have been extinguished. And Jesus is saying, this, this is me. You're celebrating and you're worshiping and you're, 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 you're in this hopeful state and yet you don't even recognize me. I am the light of the world, he says. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. This is a promise from the God of the universe, from our Savior. And so Jesus is inviting all of us. He's, if you're here tonight and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you've, you've heard about him. Maybe you think of him as just a light, right? But, but John says he's the true light. He's the true light, meaning he's, he's equated with light. He's equated with salvation completely. The word true there actually means equal in every possible respect, sharing the same nature and reality, meaning Jesus is one, the one and only, the absolute, perfect, the real, the true light. You're not waiting for anybody else. It's him, right? Instead of all these false lights, and there's so many false lights in our life, and I, I liken it to uh, those, those CFL bulbs, the, the compact fluorescent bulbs, right? You, if you put those in your house because you want to save energy, it, it works because you turn the light on and you don't have anything for about a half hour, right? It takes a long time to warm up. That's a false light to me. There's, there's, you're saving energy because it doesn't work. <laughs> there's nothing happening. Versus the incandescent bulb, which is just priceless now, right? We turn those things on, boom, you have light. You can actually find your clothes and figure out what you're doing. But there's, there's so many false lights in this world. There's false teachers, other religions who say, well, it's, it's just pick one. It's all, we're all going to the same place. That's not what Jesus said. He says he's the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him. There's a, there's a, a, a constant rebellion against God and, and, and secular humanism and, 
just Westernism and just the, the idea that humanity can figure out morality on our own. We're, we're self-sufficient. We don't need God. And that's not true. We were made by him and made for him. And there's plenty of other false lights of consumerism and philosophies and creation worship, self-help teaching. We just want to fix ourselves. We, we want to keep trying, right? I just got to put a new battery in. I'll get this thing working eventually. This, it's it's going to happen. I'll find my way out of this darkness. You will not. You're spiritually dead without Jesus. And so for those of you tonight who don't know him, he, he offers his life to you. He says, whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. If God's been prompting your heart, if you know you've been lost, this year has been utterly terrible for you, and you feel like you've been groping around in the darkness and you don't know what to do and you can't find your way out, perhaps tonight is, is that night. Perhaps the light, the truth of God's word is a beacon for you. And you need to go toward him and receive him and believe in him by faith. And you will have life. Life eternal. Now you'll still need to navigate this dark and dying world, but you'll have the God of the universe with you. He promises never to leave you, never forsake you. He's an amazing God. Ultimately, he will be our light at the end. We won't need anything else. In Revelation, I, I love this section, Revelation 21, verses uh, 22, talking about what is to come. This is future promise. And it says, And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light. And its lamp is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. Its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. They will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations. But nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but those who are written, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. If you don't know Jesus Christ, eternal darkness is your future. If you receive Christ as your Lord and Savior, eternal glory. God himself will be light. And in Revelation 22, he says it again. It says uh, in verse 5, And night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. It's a beautiful picture with our God. Derek had read out of Isaiah 9, um, and just to go back to that as we, as we close and end our time in God's word, um, this passage uh, is interesting because, I mean, God's word's for, for all time. It really impacts our daily life even today. Um, during the time of Isaiah, the, the nation of Judah, God's people in, in Jerusalem, um, they essentially turned the deaf ear to God. Uh, the king had done wicked things. The, the sacrifices, the worship were meaningless. They were, they were performing horrible injustices. And so, so consequences were coming. Judgment was coming because of their sin. And in the midst of all that, there was just this dark picture of what was going to take place. And ultimately, I mean, Judah and God's people, they, they looked to the nations. They became idolatrous. They turned their, their face from God and looked to others to help them, and those same nations that they looked to to form alliances and to help, they ended up turning on them, and God used them in judgment, and it's a terrible picture of what happens when we start looking for help other places, when we look for that light in the world around us, instead of looking to God himself. And um, we see the, the end result here at the end of chapter 8, verse 22 in Isaiah. It says, And they will look to the earth, but behold, distress and darkness, the gloom of anguish, and they will be thrust into thick darkness. Lots of darkness going on in this judgment. Thick, it's not just darkness, it's thick darkness. It's gloom of anguish. It's horrible. It's a horrible picture of what it means to be an enemy of God, to turn yourself from him to sin against him. In the midst of judgment, in the midst of this dark gloom, God always makes a way. He makes a way through his son. 
He makes this amazing promise, and this is a promise for his people, and this is a promise, obviously, for us. This is the messianic prophecy in chapter 9. So in this thick darkness, this gloom of anguish, we go to chapter 9, verse 1. It says, but there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali, and in the latter time, he, made, um, he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land before beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations or of the Gentiles. And here's the promise here. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. Beautiful picture of Christ's coming. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest. They are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the trampling warrior, battle tumult and battle tumult, and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for fire. For to us a child is born. So God's going to take, he's going to put away all this stuff all this war, all this doom, all this gloom. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness, from this time forth and forevermore. If we go back to Luke chapter 2, we see the fulfillment of this prophecy, the birth of Jesus Christ. I'm just going to read part of chapter 2, and then we'll uh, close in prayer. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius, the governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find the baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. If you haven't considered Jesus Christ, please do. He is the light of the world. He's the only one that can dispel the darkness. And the darkness will not overcome him. These are the promises of God our Father in heaven. And if you are a believer tonight, uh, we continue to celebrate this great gift of our Savior. Um, I hope you, as I have today, experienced um, I feel like today was the first day being in God's word, preparing for this service, expectant of people to come and to lift God's name high. There was this for the first time maybe in a long time, just a couple hours before service, there was a sense of peace. I feel like I've just been running hard this whole year and just haven't stopped. And God's gift to us is that we can just stop and we can celebrate and we can consider him and we can be still and we can be silent and we can sing and we can open gifts together. And when we go and leave this place and we're looking at lights on trees and on houses and we go into our home and we're lighting candles, we can remember that he is the true light, that the gifts themselves and, and all the food and all the other stuff and the things that we think are going to save us are not. Only Jesus can save. I pray that we would remember that this evening as we continue to celebrate. Let's pray.
Father, we thank you for the gift of your son. Thank you that he is the light of the world. He is the true light that has come into the world. That, Lord, we don't have to live in darkness anymore. Although we're surrounded by it as believers, we, we have the, the light of life. We have the truth of your word. It lights our way. It provides us with direction. It provides us with peace and with hope. By your word, Father, we are able to live and walk with you and have hope in this world. There's no other hope out there, Father. We have all looked. We've looked in so many places, whether relationships or technology or work status or money. All these things fade. They're just little flickers of light that we try to hold on to. They're, they're nothing. They're false. Lord Jesus, you're the only one that satisfies. You're the only one that shows the way. You're the only one that brings peace. You're the only one that provides hope. And Jesus, we know that you're the only one that can save. We thank you for this evening. Thank you for the celebration, Lord. Help us to continue in a spirit of worship now. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys are able to, let's stand for our final song tonight. We can clap. That's okay. Thank you, guys. And I want to thank everyone who's watching up in our overflow in our upper room in our activity center. Uh, thank you for coming as well. Thank you for uh, being up there together and worshiping. Um, 
thank you all for coming tonight. And I really pray as you go home and um, the light of the true incandescent bulb allows you to see your food and your gifts and, and your family, you would remember the, the true light of the world, Jesus Christ. So thank you. Merry Christmas. You're dismissed.